these green crosses is a lightning flash detected by this linear network. Uh, and you can see there's lots of flashes here. Uh, and we can see enhancements of NOx up to about 4,000 parts per billion. Parts per trillion, sorry, four parts per billion. Well, that isn't particularly different to what other people have measured. We can see that it correlates with the uh, with cloud, which is the blue bits here. Uh, this is carbon monoxide, same plot as the previous one, actually. Um, so the purple is the carbon monoxide correlating with the cloud. There are bits of cloud that don't have rocks in them, so that's interesting as well. But basically, this is similar to what people have measured in continental convection elsewhere. What's different is that you get the same thing pretty much in monsoon convection, which is supposed to be very poor at producing NOx. This is the same picture, a minute picture on the, this is the 22nd of January, the aircraft from backwards and forwards here. But in fact, prior to the aircraft, there were only a few lightning flashes. But they seem to have been very effective at generating NOx, because here's the same axis as before, and the values are about half what we were seeing in these highly energetic convective storms during the break period. So based this sort of convection is very, very widespread. And indeed, there's much more lightning later in the day after the, after the measurements were made. So we seem to be suggesting here that the, um, the monsoon convection is much more effective at producing nitrogen compounds in the upper troposphere than has previously been thought. And the reason that's important is because that's a way of generating ozone in the upper troposphere. Okay, so I'll move on quickly to the next topic. That's done that one. This is just a little bit about aerosol. The, the, the um, campaign was about aerosol. And aerosol in the upper troposphere basically is, is um, rather an interesting thing because it gets scrubbed out by the storms. So as the convective storm rises up, Almost anything that is even remotely high growth filly will attract water and nucleate a little particle. So what comes out in the anvil tends to have, and here's the, in this plot here, the aircraft flew from clear air into the anvil. So these green things here are cloud particle concentration. So where are these green things? This is where it's in cloud. Very, very low aerosol. Aerosol is the blue on the sort of yellowish colour. But out of cloud, this is air that's recently evaporated from an anvil, you have huge concentrations, both of these blue particles up to about 20,000 per centimetre cube of condensation nuclei. These are tiny particles, greater than 10 nanometres. And even accumulation mode nuclei uh, particles, which this is a different scale here, so about, going up to about 70 here. Both of them growing in the outflow after the cloud particles have evaporated. So the challenge for us now is can we understand the, the physics and chemistry of how these aerosol particles grow? And uh, one of the things we can do is to try and plot these concentrations as a bunch of time out of cloud, and we get a, a sort of characteristic time scale out of this. This is for the very small particles, the different symbols are for different flights. And uh, these are for the larger particles, so they all look very good were it not for those points up there. So obviously um, we need a rather more sophisticated model than just a straight line for this lot. Um, David Wadiker, who's looking at this, is playing around with some models for aerosol growth and nucleation to see if we can get the right time scale out of them to explain this, this growth. Okay, so in the few minutes I've got left, I'm going to change tack a little bit. I'm going to, rather than going for detailed in situ measurements, I'm going to talk a little bit about some, another result that we, oops, going the wrong way here, that we got from being in Darwin, and something that we haven't realised, and this is quite interesting meteorologically, which is the effect of frosty waves propagating from the subtropical jet modulating the convection in this region. So this is a potential vorticity plot for 335 k as it happens. This is Grant Allen plotted this. And what we have here, breaking Rossby wave and a clear stream of high potential vorticity coming. The army is just about there. And this is a, an ozone sound profile from that time. And we can see black is ozone, so we can see a peak in ozone. Blue is relative humidity. Dry, ozone-rich air, statically stable, but I haven't shown that. 
and clearly showing that this thing was real and corresponded to a little tongue of, of, of stratospheric air. So, does that matter? Does anybody care? Does it do anything? Well, yes. Um, when you have these Rossby wave events, you get what, what the tropical meteorologists in Darwin call tropical droughts. Uh, if you define that this is a little box south of Darwin, it's nearer to the jet than Darwin. And you look at the period when you have one of these high PV events over the area, and there, there's not much convection except near the coast. This is a more normal picture. Uh, these are cloud top heights from MT, south the Japanese over orbiter. And what you see is widespread convection all over the place. Far more convection here than you see in these two. So we've got an anti-correlation, if you like, between these events and cloud cover. That's what this diagram shows. This is a time series, November through to December. The blue is potential vorticity, averaged over that box. And the red is the cloud cover, again averaged over that box. And what you see is these, these things anti-correlate in this region. They don't here, but we have got a story for that. It's cloud blown in from elsewhere, in fact, not generated in situ. More clearly seen by the rainfall, this, this bottom plot is a rainfall, so the blue is from measured rain gauges. So we can see an excellent correlation, really, between the blue here and the blue here. Um, and the black is what the ECMWF model thought should be there. And clearly it's underestimated the rainfall quite a lot during this period. And then it starts to get a little bit better during the subsequent normal break period. So the tropical droughts seem to be nicely correlated with these. But the tropical droughts aren't the interesting bit. This is the interesting bit. This is a tropical plume. So this is a sequence of water vapor images taken over a period of about 12 hours. And you can see here the eruption of a large band of convection that in fact spreads all the way into Indonesia, in fact. You can see it's spreading along this line here. And when this happened, um, the it was a shock to us. The local forecasters were saying, oh, the monsoon has turned up. It looks like a monsoon. It wasn't the monsoon. Um, it very, very quickly subsided, but it managed to put out all the fires when all this convection came over. Hence the difference between my two periods earlier. One was biomass burning, the other was pre-monsoon, and it was this thing, this drenching that put out the fires. Now, we can actually explain this as well, or at least we can have a go at explaining this by looking at our Rossby wave. So here we have a cross-section, north-south cross-section, uh, along here where the convection initiated. So it's a north-south cross-section along there. Taken, this is taken from the ECMWF model. Unfortunately, we didn't have any, uh, any measurements. We were in Darwin. This thing was a long way from Darwin. But you can see this little blob here of low theta w, low um, wet well potential temperature, which gives you potential instability in this region. The model doesn't really expect much, this is a model tethogram, it doesn't expect much to go off, it's pretty stable here, but clearly uh, something did go off, you can see that in the picture. And if we take this little blob and ask where did it come from, these are the back trajectories, we can see very clearly coming from the tip, this is back trajectories, coming from the tip of one of these breaking rusty rates here. So, it's quite a nice example of the way in which these, the middle altitude disturbances on the jet stream can have quite a profound influence in organizing the meteorology in this part of Darwin, a bit in this part of Northern Australia. Okay, so I've said enough, this is my summary. I think I'm gonna leave that for you to read. There's nothing worse than people reading PowerPoint slides, so I'm going to stop at that point. Thank you very much.